become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Galatians 6, 9.
telling the Sunday school class a little bit ago, it's hard to believe that August is almost over. School is starting this week, and where has our summer gone? But, uh, we're so thankful that we can be together and uh, that uh, um, we have each one here. If you're visiting with us today, would you raise your hand? We'd like to recognize any visitors. It is good to have each one here, and we thank God for our time as we share together. I want to notice a few announcements quickly in your bulletin. First of all, book club members, you have a meeting at noon today. And if there are others here who would like to join them and learn more about the book club and help them, they usually, I think, have too much food, so they need some help finishing that off as well. Uh, so uh, the book club will be meeting at noon if you'd like to stay for that. Uh, Pastor Scott will be speaking out at Timberview this afternoon at 3. This evening, Smokey Wilson and Brenda will be here with us uh, to bring us our, our gospel concert, our message in music, and uh, we always enjoy having Smokey, and, and we always have a good group from outside as well. The folks from over at Bellrose Church are always here, and so let's come out together and, uh, and have a good time of fellowship uh, with one another and with the folks from Melrose and to hear some good music this evening. So. Uh, make note of that. Come on back, back at 6 o'clock this evening for that. Uh, we will be taking a free will offering to help support their ministry, but there's no charge for our concerts. It's just whatever you feel led to share uh, to help them with their costs. Uh, looking ahead through the week, uh, on Wednesday, there are the uh, town and country Bible study in the morning at 9.30. Uh, also on Thursday is the Facebook Live online study on Thursday at 7. Uh, looking into September, we want to mention that uh, our Christian education youth groups will be meeting beginning on the 3rd, so that's only two weeks away. Again, as I shared while ago, it's hard to believe that we're coming into, into the fall already. Uh, looking forward to uh, the camp meetings uh, coming back. Uh, in September, it'll be the 11th through the 16th over at the Virgin Park, and uh, I'm sure that you'll receive a blessing from being there. Uh, we have several pastors, Pastor Scott, of course, Pastor Bob from back in, in Burton. Uh, I think Stacy will be here one evening. And a couple of evenings. A yeah. couple of evenings. And uh, Pastor from over at Newmark, I think. Yeah, Wayne Allen. Wayne Allen. And then uh, Richard and Rita will be helping to lead our music, and so it's always a good time of fellowship and, and great messages, great preaching, and good music as we share together. So uh, mark your calendar and plan to come uh, as much as you can that week. It's the 11th through the 16th in the picnic shelter over at the Virgin Park. Uh, also in September, the St. Jude fundraiser is on the 23rd. There's more information on the back of your bulletin about that and all that's going to happen there. If you're interested in setting up a stand, uh, get in touch with Cindy. I think it says it's ten dollars uh, for a space, and whatever you make in your space is yours. This costs you ten dollars to set up. But if you have things that you don't want to set up and want to donate, uh, the church will have a stand as well. They'll we'll be raising funds and we'll go to St. Jude. So be food. Fat boys will be here. Uh, just a good time of fellowship and fun. So make note of that. Again, that is on the 23rd of September. On the 24th is the, uh, the baptism service. That will be over at Mountain Grove. Uh, we have, I think, two people that have already expressed interest. If there are others, uh, please get in touch with Pastor Scott uh, if you're interested or if you know someone who's interested in being baptized. Uh, Notice the note about school supplies. The youth have school supplies they've been collecting. And if you know of kids that need school supplies, get in touch with Michelle. And uh, she'll help you out there. Uh, notice the, uh, the uh, Christian Education Employment Opportunity. If you're interested in helping with teaching uh, or know someone that is, WRE over, this is on the other side of the county, Elkton and Riverbend, but they're looking for a teacher there. And we want to keep it quiet now, but Phyllis has a birthday coming up. She knows she has a birthday coming up, but uh, what she doesn't know yet is there's going to be a surprise party over at Antioch Church uh, on the 26th from 
two to four p.m. And if I remember correctly, she is turning ninety-eight. And so we praise the Lord for for that. And uh, if you want to help make it a, a special surprise party, make note and try to go and uh, and help her celebrate. Are there other announcements anyone would like to share at this time? I would like to just thank the people that was over there yesterday at the parsonage. We had a work, well, we didn't have a work day. We just, the fellow said he had a trailer and he could haul the brush. And if we wanted to do it, he'd do it Saturday morning. And we didn't hear about it for Thursday or Friday evening. So I said, come on and we'll do what we can. Uh, a few people showed up and we cleaned up some of the brush and walked and stuff. I want to say I appreciate that. And uh, I didn't get the word out in church in time. I couldn't, so we'll just, but we'll have a work day out here one day to work around the driveway and everything. And I'll try and get the word to everybody about that. I wanted to thank the people who did show up. It was just sort of a spur of the moment thing. He said he had the trailer ready for the brush. And we just went ahead and done it. Like I said, I will announce this one out here when we get ready. Very good. Thank you, Bob. And yes, indeed, thanks to those who were able to, to come and help. On short notice, very short notice. So uh, I know that's greatly appreciated. Any other announcements? Um, some of the folks got their bulletins early and didn't get this timeline in, sir. So if they could check their bulletins real quick and maybe we could hand out these inserts during the greeting time to make sure that everybody gets it. If you want an insert, there's a bunch of inserts out there. When you go out, just pick an extra one up. They're in the okay. bulletins. We've got plenty. I'm sure you can see it from where you are, but it looks something like this. It's another insert. It's a timeline. Yeah, it's, it's two page timelines. Yeah, that, that runs from the uh, time of Adam to the time of the flood. It's for the sermon. It would be helpful. So if you don't have that, uh, maybe uh, <coughs> Bobby says there's some out. Does anybody not have that? <coughs> so we have about uh, a half dozen. Maybe if somebody could grab a handful. And well, this if you take my handful, that would be great. There you go. Donna there. brought them up to me. The ones that were back there, Donna brought them up to me. Where is it? So, here's some. So again, if you don't have it, uh, you would raise your hand. Thank you, Fred. Fred will bring you a copy. Thank you. Just raise your hand if you don't have it. Good night, so he'll, he'll see you. Are there any other announcements then? Let's take a moment or two and greet one another, and then we will continue with our course. <laughs>
Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again this morning. We would ask that you would bless everyone here. Bless those that have to give and bless those that do not. And Lord, just bless those who are missing, whatever the reasons may be, and leave them back to us. Lord, let us all be more faithful to thee and go out and tell others about thee. We ask this in Jesus' name.
remember uh, Vivian Turner as she recovers from her broken hip and hip surgery. Okay. Uh, Vivian Turner, broken hip, hip surgery. Yes. I just want to pray for all the um, students and teachers returning to school this year that they have a safe and healthy school year. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Fred? church and prayed and asked God would spare the church 
and, and let it stand. And he was gracious, and the whole area around the church is burned to the ground, but the church still stands. Um, there may have been some wind damage, but it's pretty minor from what I hear. Um, so, uh, praise the Lord for acts of mercy like that, um, because this church in, in Lahaina will have a place to worship when they're able to go back to their area and start new buildings. So, anyways, anything else before we, yes? upon us, Lord, for you have stirred our hearts to bring these petitions before your throne today. You have heard those individuals whose hands were raised. You know the hearts of those that have need but did not speak them. You know, Lord, what we need of you before we even ask. And yet, Lord, you want us to pray. And so we answer your command to pray. We seek your face in as much, Lord, as you give us the strength. We want to do what is right and honorable in your sight. We want to follow you, Lord, in such a way that the freshness of our relationship would be evident. We want to seek you in such a way that people would know that the one thing we want to know more than anything else in this world is God and the Christ that he sent to save us. I pray, Lord, for our congregation. I pray, Father, for each one of us. Many are here, many are not. We have those, Lord, who need you today because they're unable to be with us. We have those, Lord, who need you today because the massive priorities that have been put in their way have led them away on this day. God, we need you more than we need water or air or food. We just do not need to continue to try and plot along on our own. I pray, Lord, for these needs today. People that want others to be saved, people that are in need of health, people that are starting jobs and need your wisdom, people that are uh, making transitions in their life, our sister church that is looking for a pastor and the traveling that is being done and the recovery from operations and from medications and from other things, Lord, that surround us. Lord, we are weak in the flesh, but in our weakness, you are made strong. We praise you, Lord, for seeing people through disasters and hardships in their lives. And we thank you, Lord, for this story that comes out of Hawaii that reminds us that when your people put you first, you respond with grace. God, help us to walk faithfully in all that we do. We remember.
remember our teachers and our students that are going back to school this week. We remember, Lord, our truck drivers and others that supply us with food and with material goods that are needed. We thank you for our emergency services personnel and medical technicians. We thank you for our doctors and for our teachers, for our, our graces that you've given to us, Lord, in so many forms, mothers and fathers and community leaders. So much, Lord, you have surrounded us with that we might be a happy and a gracious people. Now, Lord, be with our military and our missionaries as they are abroad, doing that for which you sent them. And may you guide us through this message this morning, that your name would be praised and that we would see the beauty in all that you've done in Jesus' name. I'm going to teach you a new word today. Antediluvian. What does that mean? Well, this is not anti-diluvian. That would be A-N-T-I. This is A-N-T-E, which means before. Okay? Antediluvian. Diluvian has to do with a word for the flood that is called deluge. D-E-L-U-G-E. -E, deluge. And so having to do with the flood would be the word diluvian. Okay? Now I'm just helping you out with this, not because I think you're dumb or because I think you're whatever. It's just a new word. And sometimes it just helps us to know what the new word means. This means before the flood. This is the time between the fall of man and the flood. And that's what we're talking about today. This period that is represented in Genesis 4. And five. You have in your bulletin a timeline. Now, the timeline is a two part timeline. So, um, when you put the two pages together, it looks like this. Alright? So, so that you can understand how that, that comes together. And uh, it was too long. To put it on one page without it being so small, you wouldn't be able to read it. So that's why it's on two pages. Gives you an idea of the passage of time between the fall and the flood. You'll see a yellow line on the one side where the flood occurs. And you'll see the only person that survives that flood is Noah. Yeah, you're, I know, you're in black and white. I got you. I'm looking at color. I forgot. Black and white. Left your heart. That's still a black line then, or a dark line at least. But you'll see where it says uh, the flood. Or, yeah. And then uh, you see another event marked out there where Enoch is taken. Okay. So that timeline will be helpful. You might want to reference it for your own personal questions, but I thought, though, that it would be something that you would find useful for today's message. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 5 is kind of, kind of uh, drawn out for you there in that timeline. So we're not going to uh, hit Genesis 5 other than to highlight it. But uh, look into Genesis chapter 4. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. 
But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will you not be accepted? But if you do what is if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, hey, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a resident, wan a restless wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times more. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one would, who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Uh, Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, to Irad the father of Mahujalal, and Mahujalal was the father of Methusael, and Methusael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one of them Ada, the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to, uh, to uh, Jabel, and he was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all the stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naoma. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain's avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. Adam made love to his wife again. She gave birth to a son and gave him the name Seth, saying, God has granted me another son in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. And at the time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Okay. This is just one of the stories of the antediluvian era. And uh, the story of chapter 5 includes the story of Enoch, not Enoch of Cain, but Enoch of Seth, and how he was taken from the earth. We're not going to capitalize on everything, but uh, we are going to, first of all, give you kind of a rundown of what was going on at the time. First of all, if we remember that this is not the earth that we now know, then we must, first of all, put our heads into the heads of the people of the time. The land was in one land mass at the time, and there was one sea at the time. Okay, this is found in Genesis 1-9. The Lord gathered all the waters into one place, and dry land appeared. Okay, it doesn't say the Lord gathered all the waters into many places. He gathered them all into one place. There was one mass of land. Now, scientists in the past have called this Pangea. Uh, just a, basically means all the world is what that term means, Pangea. All the world. 
and uh, all the land was in one place at this time. They didn't know uh, continents and they didn't know all of this kind of thing. They just had one land mass and one sea. Um, another thing about this uh, pre-Diluvian world, anti-Diluvian world, was there was no clouds or rain. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 5 through 7, we have the method by which the land was watered and it specifically says that there was no rain at the time. Now this is God's testimony to Moses about what God knew and about what God thought was worth retaining. Okay, so what we see here in the book of Genesis in chapter 4 is not Moses repeating some verbal tradition that was handed down over generations and like telephone subjected itself to the law of entropy and when it got to Moses it was nothing but uh, fairy tales and stories. Uh, those that are in liberal churches are hearing this kind of thing about these passages all the time. Okay, this is not verbal tradition. Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and he wasn't just up there scratching himself. Okay, he was up there talking to God. God was giving him this testimony, which is God's testimony about what happened in an era where nobody was left but God to tell about it. Okay, it's so important that you understand this. Because if you talk to your friends that go to liberal churches, they're going to say, oh, I see you're a literalist. Or they're going to say, oh, well, that was just stories. Oh, that was just analogies. Oh, well, do you really believe that? And you're going to be shocked because these friends, <coughs> these friends of yours that go to liberal churches, their churches still have the name Christ on the front or Christian on the front. And you would think that those people would, would accept the Bible that they would accept what it says, that they would do what it says, that they would listen to what it says, that it would be superior to everything else, but it's not. To them, the scripture is nothing more than a screwdriver in a toolbox, one of many tools by which they learn and, and live. For us, folks, this is the living word of God, the living, breathing word of God. The word of God to which we subject ourselves in totality. Because it is God's testimony and not man's. And therefore we listen to what God has to say. And what he thought was important for us to remember was that tent making came before the flood. That music was invented before the flood that the forging of iron came before the flood. Current history will tell you that, that uh, iron smelting can be traced back to Phoenicia, a certain age, that would be modern day Philistine area, uh, Gaza Strip area. They say that as far as archaeology is concerned, that's the furthest back that they can trace it. But God testifies that forging of iron for weapons and such came before the flood. And so we have this testimony here. But there were no clouds or rain. God's testimony that in the morning the mist would come up from the ground, the dew, and would water the ground. And then those waters then would return to the underground stream. Another thing that we see here before the flood in the antediluvian era is a vapor canopy, most likely ice <coughs> crystals, that were above the firmament. Uh, that word firmament means the sky or the atmosphere. In Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8, we have the record of God separating the waters below from the waters above. And all through the earth, there was a vapor canopy. We know that it caused the whole earth to have almost a temperate or tropical climate. To the extent at which we can find uh, tropical ferns 
and uh, other tropical fossils in Alaska and Antarctica. Now, of course, those that don't want to believe the testimony of God and are trying to come up with their own theories, they say, well, the reason is because at one point the earth was like this. And so in those tropical regions, that was Alaska and Antarctica. And at some point the earth went like this. And then we have the current North and South Poles. It, 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 takes, it, it, it takes more uh, cartoony kind of logic to believe that than it does to believe the straight testimony of God. The straight testimony of God is simple. He separated the waters from below, the waters above. The whole earth was covered with a vapor canopy. Uh, like I said, in the upper atmosphere, it would have been probably crystallized. The, now, I, you've got to understand that when I get upset with cartoony scientists, I am not upset with real scientists. Does that make sense? Okay, if two people come to you and one person tells you something that is serious and is verifiable, and another person comes up to you and tells you a crazy joke or a crazy story, okay, you have two sources of information. You're going to go with the serious one, not the crazy one. Right? Okay, so in science, there are crazy scientists and there are real scientists. So far, so good. So I'm not saying that I am opposed to science. The Bible is not opposed to science. So when I say this, that scientists tell us that our pituitary gland, which is in charge of the changes in our anabolism and catabolism, our metabolistic or metabolic system, which causes us to grow and causes us to age, it's affected by our exposure to ultraviolet radiation. Now, with a vapor canopy all over the whole world, the ultraviolet radiation is very minimal. And what happened was that the people aged very slowly because of that. So at the age of 100, a person might look as if they were 20. Now, I know there's plenty of you here that are nearing the age of 100 that would love to be like you were when you were 20. Because ever since the flood, when the waters above came down, out of the sky, we have had clouds and rain. We have never since seen uh, a return to that vapor canopy. Now the, the uh, revelation tells us there will be a return to that and it tells us how. We've already talked about it. Uh, when we were doing the revelation series, I'm not going to go into that. That would be a rabbit hole I may never recover from. But this is why everybody is aging so slowly, is because of this vapor canopy. So these are the conditions of the earth at the time. It's not the earth you and I know right now, okay? It, it is and it isn't. The conditions are different. Okay, let's talk about Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were likely more than 100 years old when this story takes place. If you reference your timeline, you'll see that Seth was born when Adam was 130 years old. Which, since Seth's birth, was soon after the murder of Abel, Abel and Cain had to have been somewhere between 100 and 130 years old. So they had already lived on the earth as brothers for quite some time. Uh, they were not, uh, in, in our terms, they would have been somewhat in their 20s in their aging process compared to our aging process. But they had lived for more than 100 years at this time. They were not, you know, young men in their 20s or whatever as you and I know our 20s. But they had actually lived on the earth more than 100 years at this time. 
So uh, during that hundred years, you do understand that Adam and Eve had other children, right? Sons and daughters during that time. Cain and Abel were the two oldest sons of the whole group of people. Now, a lot of your friends that want to give you a hard time ask the question, where did Cain get his wife? From among his sisters is the answer. And somebody says, oh, I thought that was wrong. They didn't have laws like that back then. They didn't have any other women to pick from back then. Abel, if he was married, would have married his sister. Cain would have married his sister. And if Seth married anybody that wasn't his sister, it was probably his niece. Okay, there was no other people on the face of the earth to choose from. You say, well, what about all these other people that Cain said would find him and would kill him if they found out? Where did those, all, all those other people come from? His family. This is very simple. It's a very simple answer to the question. That's his family. If they find out that he killed their brother Abel, do you not think that they would be a little miffed? A little upset with Cain? Don't you think they'd be a little scared of him? And feel like he needed to be wiped out? And so Cain has this concern that he brings before God. Now, there was no law at the time. That's another thing you need to know about this antediluvian period. There was no law. And so what Cain did, Cain did. And God showed his judicial prowess in that he put a mark on Cain. We'll talk about that in a few moments. God's approval of Abel's offering reveals something to us. First, I want to take the scriptures uh, review of Abel in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel brought to God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. By faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. So there are some things that the Bible already says in review of Cain and Abel's story, and that is that Abel's offering was better, that Abel was commended by God as righteous, and that what Abel did continued to speak after Abel's death and continues to this day. So, let's put this into, uh, into more practical terms, okay? First of all, it reveals that faith in, in love is the foundation of worship. Abel's attitude towards God was one of worship. He had faith in love. He brought the firstlings of his flocks, the Bible says. He brought an offering that in some way was an attempt to show Christ, even though Abel didn't know who Christ would be. But by faith, he did have some idea. The next thing that it shows is that a lamb is God's chosen symbol for Christ. God could have chosen the fruits of Cain's offering, and he could have said, the fruits of your labor, that is what I choose. But he did not. Because we cannot labor for our salvation. It is the lamb, the innocent lamb, giving his life for guilty Abel. That is the symbol God chooses. And he chose that symbol and used it throughout the entirety of the Bible, clear up into Revelation, where it calls Christ a lamb looking as though he had been slain. The next thing we see here is that God opposes the proud, 
but exalts the humble. God's opposition to Cain's proud offering of his labors in the field was not the same as God's reaction to Abel's complete abandonment of the firstlings of his flock. A labor that was not his, but that was the labor of the mother of that lamb. A commodity in some fashion, for that commodity was a representation of the guilt of Abel. Cain's response to God's approval of Abel's, of Abel, it reveals something to us as well. Turn to 1 John, we want to get the Bible's take on it. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. Looking at verse 12. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Here in the scripture, it tells us that the offering of Cain was evil. His actions were evil. Cain's act, or Abel's actions were righteous. Cain was angry at Abel because Abel did what was right. And what Cain did was rejected. The scripture is clear in its analysis of Cain's offering. It was an evil offering. Cain belonged to the evil one. There is no excuse for Cain's offering. A humanist may take a look at Cain's offering and may say, well, what was the harm? The Bible takes a look at Cain's offering and says it was evil. So there are three things that we can learn about Cain's offering and what it teaches us here. First of all, it teaches us that God cannot be coerced or appeased. You can't get God to do what you want him to do. And you can't get God off your back. That's what appeased means, is to get somebody off of your back. And coerced just simply means you're trying to get somebody to do what you want them to do. You can't coerce God and you can't appease God. Cain's offering was evil in that he was trying to get God's approval and didn't, and that angered him. It was evil in that he was trying to appease God by showing him and displaying before him his labors and what they had yielded. And God was not impressed, and God cannot be coerced. Another thing that we learn is that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Often people can combine those and they say pride goes before a fall, but it's not. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The pride of Cain was what destroyed him. His haughty spirit before God was what caused him to fly into a jealous rage against Abel. The lack of restraint by law was what gave it Cain the full justification to kill his brother Abel. But there should have been a restraining grace upon Cain that this was his brother. But he loved not his brother. He hated his brother because his brother was accepted and he was rejected. Now, 
Hypothetically, you can say, what if Cain had repented, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sure, whatever, but he didn't. That's, so the story isn't the what if. The story is the story, and the what if, I mean, goodness, you could come up with a hundred what ifs, and it still wouldn't make the story any less that it happened. The third thing it teaches is that merit-based religion hates those who receive God's grace without merit. It angers religious people that you've been chosen by God and saved by God and there's nothing you can point to to say that you deserve this grace. It angers them. Because they work very hard, like Cain laboring in the field, trying to produce a crop and then proudly displaying his crop before the Lord in an offering. These religious people that surround you are trying to earn their salvation. One of their favorite sayings is, I look at it this way. In the end of time, God will weigh out my good and my bad, and if my good outweighs my bad, I'll go to heaven. No, it won't happen at all that way. If you appear before God with nothing but the work of your hands to offer him like Cain, you will be rejected. But if you appear before God based upon the fact that he is sovereignly chosen to save you without any merit to point to, without any deserving quality about you whatsoever, he has made that choice on his own, by himself, for himself. You have nothing to worry about in that day. For if it is God that has chosen to save you, then there is no one that can unsave you. You will stand against the forces of hell itself because God will give you the strength to stand. Jesus died 2,000 years ago, roughly speaking. And so since you have been saved since that time, it's safe for us to say that Jesus certainly died for future sins. Because you are a future sin. Which means that even though you've been saved and you may commit a sin here and there, God has saved you even from those future sins. Even you are sitting here right now and some of you may stumble, may fall. Or backslide even. God can still save you from those future sins because he already has determined to save you from those sins. And when God has determined something and he says that his gifts are without repentance, you can know that if he has given you the gift of eternal life, it is without repentance. It is not based upon your merit, but on the merit of another. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and Abel did a perfect job in displaying the story of salvation and the offering of this lamb before God. Let's talk about God's approach. Because there is a third party in this story. First of all, no law was given, so Cain was marked to prevent revenge killing. God did not want this murder to result in more and more justified murders until the whole family of Adam and Eve were wiped out. And so Cain was sent away with a mark on his head. Cain was not killed. You know that it says, after Noah, it says that if man sheds blood, then by man his blood must be shed. But that law is not in place at this time. Nobody has any law. In the entire antediluvian period, God gave men no law. Now, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Because that is true, if men were inherently good or even inherently neutral, 
then by the time we get to Genesis 6, we should see an utter utopia on this earth. Instead, we see a world so evil that God floods it out and destroys everyone. Second of all, God let mankind manage themselves. He kept his hands out of it. He didn't engage. He didn't, he didn't build a nation. He didn't build a people. He didn't, uh, he didn't interact on them. All we see is that men begin to seek after God after Abel is killed. For his sacrifice, it inspires other people to do like Abel did. Remember, there's no strangers at this time. It's family. <coughs> and they've been family for around 100 years at this point. So this is an established relationship in these families. These families are all part of one family. And that's Adam and Eve. And mom and dad are very much alive at this time. They're pretty much running the whole family, pretty much running the whole shebang. And when Abel is killed, the rest of the family begin calling out on God using the method that Abel used. A method that up until then, as far as the scripture is concerned, was not established. It was not a commandment of God Somehow, perhaps through the observation of God's killing of an animal to provide clothing for mom and dad, it may be that that was what inspired Abel in this direction. We don't know why Abel offered a better offering. But we know that it was accepted by God as a symbol of his son. And that after the murder of Abel was known among his brothers and sisters, they began to seek God. But God was not directly engaged in the development of the society. He left it to the people. And it was for a reason. It wasn't that that was what he was always going to do or what he preferred. It was for a reason, to demonstrate something to us, which we see in Genesis 6. Last of all, God intervened only for his larger purposes. Where it came to his conversation with Cain, it was for his larger purpose to prevent revenge killings. You can see that his sometimes great-grandson Lamech uh, misunderstood the whole concept and in his foolishness, he said to his wives, I, I killed somebody just for wounding me. They wounded me. So if Cain is avenged, well then I'm avenged 70 times. Misunderstood the whole thing. God also intervened where it came to Enoch. Enoch was chosen by God as one of two men that would be removed from history and would return to history in the future as his two witnesses. Still our future at this point. The only two ever removed from history, Enoch and Elijah. And these will be the two witnesses spoken of in the book of Revelation that will return. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. These have not died, but they will die. The book of Revelation talks about their death. So Enoch was removed, not because Enoch was so righteous that God couldn't stand to leave him here on the earth. He was removed by God's foreknowledge and election to be placed at the end of time as one of his two witnesses. Okay? So if you're a Sunday school teacher or you're teaching your children at home, please don't say. If you were just righteous enough, if you were just holy enough, if you were just good enough... God might snatch you out and not make you die, just like Enoch or Elijah. Don't do that. That's not why they were taken out of the world. OK? 
Okay? All of God's law, all of God's commandments, all of God's statements that he has ever made must come to pass upon every human being. There's no exceptions and no exceptional human beings. The only exceptional person that ever lived was Jesus Christ. And he is your salvation. We're going to continue from here in the coming weeks talking about the flood. Uh, it's going to be ever, either interesting or devastating. I don't know how you want to look at it. But let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. And then uh, we will have the, just the doxology and the ending prayer, okay? Thank you, Lord, for this message. Thank you for the information. Thank you, Lord, that you gave us a testimony so that we know what happened and, and what to believe. For coming from your mouth, Lord, it is absolutely true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>